Being able to physically capture a rocket launch from the roof of the VAB is a surreal experience, but it wasn't always something that was allowed here at the NASA press site. In fact, it wasn't allowed until 1995, and I have the exclusive story that you probably haven't heard before about how those rules were changed with the help of a little bear named Magellan and some major perseverance. Yes. Oh, we're looking. We're just looking. You're it. looking at me. All right, kid. Ellie in space here with Mark Usiak. And I met you, is, did I say it right? You did say it right. Oh, okay. Well, I was trying, I was, uh, I was, well, I was trying to figure out where we did meet, Florida. I guess. <laughs> you look so like right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I met Mark a few months ago on my trip to Florida, where I also interviewed Tim Dodd and Felix Wood about it, a very productive trip. Yep. But I met you, and you've been a longtime Cape photographer, so tell me how long. Whew. 1971 was my first launch. Apollo 15, July, third to last moon landing, and my brother, who's older than me, got a press pass. And back in those days, each press person was allowed to take two dependents husband, wife, kids, brother, whatever. So me and my dad went as my brother's dependent, and we ended up, they put us in a site over where the Saturn V building is now. So it was just an empty field with porta potties and a bleacher. And I stood there and, and watched that thing, and it was just like, ugh, it was the greatest thing I ever saw in my life. And, and you were hooked. I was hooked. <laughs> well, we were hooked as little kids. I mean, my parents would let us stay home from school to watch the moonwalks. And, Wow. Gemini launches when they were on TV. and So I've always had a, an interest in space, and a lot of that was because of my brother, too, since he's six years older than me, and he was interested in it. And we kind of married the love of photography and the love of space and went from there. And, just and you're still doing it. After all these years, uh, <laughs> I'm so gray. <laughs> but, no, it was great. I mean, the friends that we've made, astronauts that I've got to know and meet really well. And the policies that you've changed. And the policies. Because, just one. just one, but it really piqued my interest. We were at dinner and you told me this story and I feel like this is a really interesting story that not a lot of people know or maybe right. just take for granted that of course photographers can shoot on the top of the VAB at the Cape and that has not always been the case. And even crazier is that there's a little bear tied to this whole story. So how should we start this? Well... Uh, With the bear, which came first, well, the bear or the roof? Well, actually the bear came first, but my interest in the roof came from when I was accredited for Apollo 16. And standing there in the press site and looking out three and a half miles to Pan A, and then looking over my left shoulder and saying, boy, I, I wonder what the view is like from up there. It's gotta be awesome. I mean, I was slobbering standing on the ground, but just trying to figure out what it would be like to be up there. And they had television cameras there, and there was a TV guy sitting there, but I never knew that they didn't take press people up. Now they could take cameras up and clamp them and then the photographers would come down and then somebody on the ground pushed a button and fired the cameras but they couldn't track it mm. so there was a neat tv news guy sitting there in a, with a big back then the tv cameras were like the size of this this big and they would track it but there was no still photographers uh, except there was probably a NASA guy up there every once in a while, but no regular media like AP, UPI, the local press down in Florida, because I got to know a lot of those guys from being there for so many launches. Orlando Sentinel, Florida Today, Miami Herald, all those guys were allowed to go up and clamp cameras on. But I didn't have the fancy cameras that you needed to have wires and triggers, plus I didn't have the didn't have the pool, so to speak, because it was only for like what they called like the, the pool the pool cameras, the, the wire services. Right. Okay. And there was no digital back then. Of it was course. Still film. But you and wanted to be up there. I, I, I looked at that like it was 
the holy grail of like being in the best seat in the house. And I, I've always wanted to go up. And as we progressed through shooting through the last couple of Apollo missions in the Skylab, in the Apollo Soyuz, and then when the shuttle started in 1981, we started to get into more fancier cameras. We had remote cameras that were set off by sound that you could put out at the launch pad the day before for like maybe a quarter mile back and get some, whenever you see a real good close up shot, it's from a remote camera. Right. Nobody's standing there, obviously, but <laughs> nowadays with lenses, it looks like you are with the stuff they have. But so we had been putting remote cameras out from 1981 all the way through the end of the shuttle program. But it was mid shuttle program that my encounter with our little blue friend kind of changed my life and changed the lives of all the photographers that have always wanted to go up but had never got a chance to. What was the reason that you were given at the time for the, why you couldn't go up there physically? Well, it was a couple things. They all, they kind of pull out, well, it's a safety issue or um, we never did it before. And, you know, I, those things just, I, it just didn't sit right with me yeah. because, I mean, this was after the Challenger accident which was close to a worst case scenario short of exploding on the launch pad. And there was nothing safety wise in the, the VAB. I mean, right. it was so far away. That's why they put it that way. So anyway, so we, uh, I tried to pursue going through channels. I mean, you have to remember this is all before email. This is all before internet. This is all before, I mean, this was letter writing and, faxes and telephone calls and that kind of stuff. This is early 90s that, that my interest started to really peak to say, you know, what's it going to take to get up there to get some shots? And then STS-60, we were setting remote cameras out, my brother and I, Carlton as well. Hey, Carlton. And uh, <laughs> um, we were setting cameras out, waiting for the bus to take us back to the press site. And this lady, these two ladies get off of this smaller bus and they're holding this big blue Paddington bear dressed up in a, like an aviator suit with the goggles and the hat and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, they were taking pictures of each other holding the bear with the shuttle in the background. And I just said, Hey, you want me to take a shot with both of you? Cause obviously before selfies. And so I took a picture of them and, um, we exchanged, I said, well, well, you know, my brother owns a photography lab and he was going to make them prints and send them to her. Well, then we exchanged uh, cards and really got to know each other through correspondence and stuff. She lived uh, in uh, Colorado, in Evergreen. Her name was Penny Whittakey and she's now passed away. Um, God bless her soul. Thank you, Penny. And um, she... Uh, she said that'd be great. She couldn't get pictures from NASA for one reason or another because she was an educator. I don't know. She gave me some kind of story. So we, we exchanged and, and we got to, got to get our stuff to, to her and she was just thrilled with it. And she told me the story of the bear and that it was going to go up in space and that's why they were there. She had been in negotiations with NASA for months because they had to do all this protocol work. They had to clean it and vacuum pack it, right. put it in a bag, and it was going to go up on a, a space hab mission. And uh, she was telling me all this stuff, and I said, well, you know, I'll try and get down. I'll, I'll get down to shoot that launch. And she said, that'd be great. So a year went by. It flew, I believe, on STS-63, which was the following year. And I said, you know, we sent her a bunch of pictures from her launch, and she really loved them. She was a, a school, um, I guess she was like the media coordinator for the, her elementary school. And the school that she taught at, or, or worked at, was in Colorado, but there was a lot of kids there whose parents were airline pilots for United. So she had this idea years before I knew her, to take this bear and give it to these pilots and they flew, fly it all around the world when they go on different things. So it's like, here's, here's Magellan sitting on the Great Wall of China and here's Magellan 
with Mount Fuji in the background, you know. So the bear had a passport that was like, you know, wow. that thick. And it had been to some crazy places, submarines, uh, South Pole. It slept in, uh, slept in uh, Al Gore's son's bedroom at the White House. I mean, all these crazy things. And, and she goes, I wanted to get that bear in the space. Because there were some astronauts that also were from that Colorado area. So I think she might have been in negotiation, hopefully through them and through what, you know, whatever contacts that she had made. And finally got it to be approved as part of a payload that, that was going to fly. And it went up. We shot the pictures of it taking off. It made it into People magazine as one of the great stories of the year, I think, in 1995. And um, I said, you know, I, after that flight flew, I was continually trying to get up, see what I could do to get up on the roof. Right, shoot. right. So um, wasn't really getting anywhere going through proper channels. It wasn't like I did anything illegal or bad. It was just, it, you just weren't, I wasn't getting anywhere. To I'll be persistent and yeah. be creative sometimes. That, that's true. That's true. So uh, I made a call to her <laughs> and uh, I told her, I said, Penny, I've been trying to, to, to be able to get up to shoot a launch on the roof of the VAB and, and I'm not really getting anywhere. And she was two hours behind time-wise and, and because she was in Colorado, I'm in Pennsylvania. And I called her up and I said, uh, you remember when you asked me if you could ever do a favor for me? I said, oh, I want to cash one, one <laughs> favor in for something that I wanted ever since I was a little kid. And she goes, uh, let me see what I can do. And I get off the phone with her, and about five or six minutes later, I get a phone call from NASA down in Florida. And uh, got a call from uh, Director of Public Affairs, uh, Mr. Hugh Harris, in, uh, at the Cape. And I, my brother and I know Hugh really well, even to this day. Uh, we say hi, and we see each other when we do trips down Florida. And uh, he goes, Mark, I'm looking here at your letter. Uh, <laughs> about trying to get up on the roof for uh, STS-71. He said, uh, I think we can make that work. He said, uh, when you guys get down here, just ask for me, come back to my office, and, and uh, we'll take care of it. So then uh, I said, gee, Hugh, thanks a lot. I mean, that's great. Um, can't wait to see you. Looking forward to getting the launch. So I called Penny back. <laughs> I said, Penny, You'll never guess who I got a phone call from. And she started laughing because she knew right away. She uh, made the right, rattled the right chain. Right, I right. Guess. And uh, she contacted her good friend who happened to be the uh, center director, uh, Mr. Jay Honeycutt. Uh, so he was basically the Pope, the overlord of the Cape at the time. <laughs> and uh, he made sure that the Public Affairs Division took care of my brother and I's photo request. And at that time, I didn't know it was such a big thing as far as not having guys stay up there. I thought that people were always up there. I didn't know it was kind of, I thought that they, they weren't letting me up because I wasn't from a big organization. Right. And I figured, well, certainly Time and Life and Newsweek and all these other magazines that aren't probably in existence anymore, but were big back in the 90s, I figured they have to have somebody up there. And it was a shock to me when we went up with a bunch of those guys, about a dozen, um, up on the roof, and two escorts from NASA were with us. And uh, one of them who, uh, well, actually, Two of them, two of the three, there was three es escorts actually, um, have passed away. But they were good friends because we've known them because we've been down there for 30 years, 20 years shooting. So we all go up with a group of other photographers and the other photographers are clamping their cameras on and they're plugging their wires in and doing this and that. My brother and I set our tripods up over at the, the railing looking straight out. Now we're 525 feet up 
looking straight out and it's the best view in the world it really is it was it was better than i thought so all the other photographers you know have to go down <laughs> and that didn't go over too well <laughs> with no. some of them and um to make a long story short, um, they should be building a statue of my brother and I <laughs> up there because we basically broke the, not a glass ceiling, but metal, metal roof, let's say. Right. We, we broke the metal roof, and from that mission on, NASA allowed a group. They, first, they started with a list, and then it was like a lottery and a pool and all that kind of stuff. So they would take anywhere from a dozen to two, two dozen guys up for each launch, but they would rotate. Now the wire service guys would always go and like the local papers in Florida would always go. So they were kind of grandfathered in that they can always go up. But then there was another 10 or so that maybe a guy from Chicago could go up one time and a guy from New York could go up and I could go back up. You know, it, was, it wasn't like I, it wasn't like I went up there and had to have that spot every time. You know, it's just, I was up there for a night launch. I was up there for a morning launch. I was up there for uh, a late afternoon launch, which was the best ever. It was STS-133, and it was a late afternoon launch. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. The sun was at my back. The sky was blue. The air was clear, and it took until almost the end of the shuttle program for me to get the most perfect pictures from up on top. Wow. And it was, you know, it, it, it was just like, uh, it's getting, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. And I got to know uh, one of the astronauts, Nicole Stott, really well. It was on that mission. And I gave her some prints uh, at an event that I saw her at. And she really said, wow, wow, you know, she's, she's good. She's what really is good. it like today? Um, can anyone go up there? Like, a, as far I, as... I think... Now, I know for Artemis, they clamped it down again. There was, no, uh, there was no people that were allowed up, and they went back to the old ways. Mm. Well, all the public affairs people are gone. Center directors changed over a couple times, and they're just going back to the old way. And unless they're taking some other animal or critter up and somebody does the same thing. I don't know if they'll ever open it up for the Artemis launches. Now they do, I think, I think that, well, I'm pretty sure they do. They take them up for like SpaceX launches. Okay. Because those things are so, and, and it all depends. Like a SpaceX launch for a NASA payload, I think you can get up. But if it's a SpaceX launch for, you know, a paying customer or something mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I don't quote me on that. I don't want to say any of that's 100% true. But, I mean, I've seen pictures from other photographer friends of mine that have been up there since the end of the shuttle program and have gotten stuff. But it's not, it's not one of those things that's kind of, they don't take, like, 20, 30 people up like they used to toward the end of the shuttle program. It was a, it was a good group up there because they knew it was coming to the end and they were just wanted to give everybody a shot that maybe didn't have it before. I don't know. I, I don't know what the pecking order was as far as who went and who didn't. All I know is I got up and I got up first. So <laughs> I'll be my plant the flag. <laughs> and all because you helped uh, an educator and her yep. little bear. Exactly. Exactly. And that bear now resides in the Smithsonian. Uh, and, and I've got a... Eileen Collins, if you're watching this, <laughs> I want to talk to you about that because I, you were the pilot on the mission that it flew in STS-63. And I, just, I wondered, it was back in the Space Hab module, which is kind of like a mini space station that was back inside the cargo bay. So it wasn't, it wasn't in the shuttle and the mid-deck. You had to float through a tunnel and go back into this lab, and it was in a locker inside that lab. And... Um, I'm fortunate to have a picture of it floating in space, which I will make sure you get a copy of so you can see it. But um, it wasn't, and it was really kind of crazy back then because NASA really didn't publicize it as far as being part of it because it, I don't think that they wanted everybody 
sending stuff in right. to fly. Like, that you know, makes now sense. there's already Buzz Lightyear's up, and there's Pluto the dog, and, and Mickey Mouse sure. things, and all that kind of stuff. And they just, it was, it was really kind of kept quiet uh, that the bear even went up while the mission and stuff was going on. And I have to tell a funny story that just came back into my mind. A good friend of mine worked at the, uh, at the Capitol building. And another good friend of mine, Bob Walker, a uh, congressman from the district where I'm from in Pennsylvania, was chairman of the science committee at the time in Congress. And uh, I have some pictures of him with the bear and, and his uh, press secretary, Melissa Sabatine, um, she was walking with the astronauts down the halls of Congress, going from Bob's office to one of the meeting rooms where they were going to testify or get an award or something. And uh, she turned around to the uh, to one of the crew and said to them, uh, "Which one of you guys was in charge of the bear?" And she said, "She told me this." She says they stopped in lockstep. And almost, she almost ran into him. <laughs> and she, they looked at her and said, how did you know about the bear? So, I mean, it was that closely held wow. tight secret of that kind of stuff going on. And we, jo I still see Melissa and she goes down here in, in the DC area. And we still joke about that even to the day about the bear and the, the story in, in Washington when she was walking down the hall and they, they all stopped and just said, she goes, how did you know about that bear? Oh my and gosh. And she told them the story about me and Penny and everything else and they got a good laugh out of it. But, you know, that was back, again, that was, that was back in the, the mid 90s within, probably within, uh, well, it was after they came back from their flight, and they were doing a tour in Washington. So it was wasn't even a couple of weeks since the bear had flown, and they just they couldn't believe <laughs> believe that she knew that it was on the payload manifest. <laughs> So some Sorry, people are that. still on, or some people still get to shoot up there, right now? They do. Okay. They do. Um, I like I said, I don't know what I know for Artemis. It was a no. It was no. And they went back to the, because I talked Safety. to some of the guys. Well, they clamped their cameras. Yeah. So there are pictures from up top. Sure. There. But they clamped and then went down and fired from from the ground. So there was nobody. There may have been a NASA photographer up there, um, a TV guy. I don't know. But, I mean, I can't remember if, if I mean, seen images of the Artemis launch from up there. I just want to make sure they hadn't, like, they're not closing it down for good i don't know i i don't know it's it's, it's like i said it's a total total different regime yeah that's running there and even through the press and of course the administrator and all the different center directors and stuff are different and public affairs people are different um so when i was down there for artemis i didn't hardly know anybody i mean i saw some of the old photographers from back in the shuttle days and we had a good laugh and, and sure and talk but a lot of the, the newer guys coming up, the, you know, that's it's a totally different breed. Everybody's on their computers and they're just... Well, it's an origin them. story that probably a lot of the newbies don't know. And that's true. That is true. That uh, it was kind of... A few friends knew. I mean, it wasn't really published anywhere. Um, so you're getting an exclusive here as far as the total behind the scenes. And, uh, but it was fun. I mean, it was... Like I said, it was a chance encounter. And yeah. It was a one in a million shot, and I didn't know that she had the connections that she did. And I, I just said to her, I said, I've been trying to get up on the roof of that building for 30 years. And <laughs> I, I said, uh, I'm just going to throw out a Hail Mary pass here. If you could do anything, I'd appreciate it. And things fell into place in five minutes. And here we are. The rest is history. I really hope you enjoyed that video. This is something that I was actually working on right before I broke my leg. And then with the chaos of breaking my leg, being in the hospital, and then focusing my attention to Starship, 
I didn't have time to get this story out until now, but I think it's a great story and probably an exclusive story that you've never heard before because yes, shooting on the roof of the VAB was not always a thing. So I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to like this video, subscribe to Ellie and Space, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.